I think we're seeing just the beginning, honestly, of all of these traditional activities being taken online and using kind of like novel 2.0 marketing ways to engage investors. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm excited to have Salvador Brigman on. Salvador, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? I am doing excellent. A little bit about uh, Salvador. He founded the popular blog, Crowd Crux, uh, and that's been cited on the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, CNN, and more. He helps entrepreneurs raise money on crowdfunding platforms, uh, especially like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, uh, and he's been... Uh, very busy in that industry. He's got a couple books. He's got Kickstarter launch formula. He's also has a, a book called the real estate crowdfunding explained um, and just helps people get set up on these platforms and, and raise a ton of money on them. So excited to introduce you and, uh, and also just explain to our listeners a little bit more about kind of your background, where you came from and, um, uh, and really what you're doing today. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, well, thank you for having me on. I, I got up into the industry in 2012. So this is right around when Kickstarter was starting to become more popular. And, um, you know, I was kind of wondering like everyone, like how is it that these people are getting funding? There was at one point in time when there was like this potato salad Kickstarter campaign. This guy raised 50 grand just to make potato salad. I'm like, how's this guy, how's this happening, you know? So I started to research it myself. Um, I did like a mini econ thesis on it when I was in college. And then I started a blog on the topic and that kind of grew over time. Um, I started to explore some other areas of crowdfunding, like real estate crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, charitable donations, nonprofits. And I just kind of realized there's whole untapped industry out there when people are trying to figure out how to raise money and they don't know how to do it. So, you know, that kind of led to a lot of stuff himself, like the YouTube channel, um, I do a podcast where I bring on uh, individual entrepreneurs, creative types that have raised money, you know, million dollars, 500K, sometimes like 50K. And I really just try to understand like what's happening behind the scenes and kind of deliver that, that information to people out there. Awesome. Awesome. So, so what is happening behind the scenes? Like what, what are some of the things that you're seeing the people that are successful do? Yeah, I mean, well, Kickstarter is so different than a lot of other platforms. So you've never heard about it before. It's kind of a little bit like Amazon, but think of it as when you're going and browsing on Kickstarter, every um, campaign that you support or every item that you pre-order, you're basically backing an inventor or someone who's like just now creating this new product and trying to get it out there into the marketplace. You're not going to get it until like three months down the line, maybe five months down the line, right? So it's a little bit different in that way. Um, when it comes to backers and when it comes to creators, I mean, we're just seeing so many individual small teams raise money on the platform, like board games, gadgets, and gizmos. You know, one of the recent ones, uh, this past month was Frosthaven. I don't know if you've heard about that one. This raised $12 million for a board game, a tabletop game on Kickstarter, which is pretty insane. Yeah. So we have a lot of technology gadgets and gizmos, design products, fashion items, um, board games, tabletops, card games, et cetera, a lot of those types of projects. And people are just able to kind of present it to the, the world. And if they like it, get funding. You know, it's obviously the kind of more that goes into it, but just from the broad strokes, like that's what it allows you to do. So raise 12 million on that deal. What, what are the people that, that uh, pledged money? What do they, what do they get in return? Basically you are, joining the community you're able to pre-order the game so you're going to get it delivered to your doorstep in the same way if you're buying a product and then there are some other add-ons depending on how much money you're giving so you could just give like 25 bucks and maybe get some swag or something like that you know higher tier you're going to actually get the board game and then maybe more enhanced versions or you're going to have like a character named after you or something like that Mm. so it's really a way to do like what's called co-creation where you're not just putting out a product, but your backers and your customers feel like they're kind of a part of it, you know, and they're, they're supporting the innovation and creative process. So they get the cool thing, they can play it, they can show it off with their friends, but they're also kind of like becoming a part of the community. It's kind of nice. Got it. Got it. So I think that that would be a, 
a, probably a pretty valuable thing if you're doing this Kickstarter campaign is to make sure you've got that community, got something more than just a product to yeah. provide. It sounds like that would be really important, huh? There is this one I was looking at before the call called a Hitch. It's this Kickstarter campaign going on right now, and they've raised over a million dollars. And this is for a, basically like a, a really ergonomic looking water bottle that also has a cup inside of it. So if you're doing a lot of commuting and like you don't want to carry a lot of stuff, you have this one compact water bottle. Sure. And this was in the span of 30, 60 days that they raised a million bucks on Kickstarter, wow. which is pretty awesome. It's so much, it's so much faster than going a traditional route. We're trying to go to angels and VCs, which can take, you know, six months, eight months at a time. And also you're getting access to a whole bunch of early adopter customers. And it's really validating the idea, which is the whole goal. Right. Yeah. So a lot of these campaigns, you might you know, make like 20% profit margin or something, but at the end of the day, it's really having access to this whole base of customers of people who said, yes, I want this to exist. And then you're able to go forward and actually invest time and money into building the company out, you know? Correct me if I'm wrong, but with like a Kickstarter, Indiegogo, you're not giving shares of your company. You're not giving away profits, interest, uh, anything like that. You're raising the money. Basically, the money's essentially interest free, right? Yeah, you're, you're not. The only obligation you have is to deliver on the promises you make and the rewards yeah. that you promise. So yeah. you're not get, giving away any shares of the company. This can kind of upset some people like when Oculus Rift first became a thing, they raised, I think, like two million on Kickstarter. Then they sold to Facebook for like a couple hundred million or something like that. Um, and a lot of people were kind of angry because, you know, they wish they had owned a portion of the company. But now other solutions exist where you can do what's called equity crowdfunding, where as an investor, you can own actually a part of the company. It's like Kickstarter for equity. So now that also exists. You know, back in the day, it didn't. Um, is that so now like there are more ways to do that. Is that on Kickstarter's website as well? Or no, is no, different no, no, platforms? different platforms. Like yeah. WeFunder is a big platform in that industry. Start engine. That's a big platform. Um, seed invest. Those are another one. So that, that gets a little bit, it's a very different than a Kickstarter campaign, yeah. but just the option is out there. Sure. What, when, when you're going, okay, they raised $12 million for this board game. They, they're giving away some games. Well, let's say I gave $25 um, and I got the board game. Like, am I getting a discount on the game? Am I paying more for the game? Um, how does, like, how does that work if I'm looking at actually putting the money into it? Yeah. So you're almost always getting some kind of a discount, discount off of what's going to be offered via retail. And then also usually with the campaign, you have what are called early bird reward tiers where the creator kind of creates a limited number of really low priced rewards that kind of get like initial funding in the gate. And that's one of the ways that like you prime the pump before you, you know, get more attraction on Kickstarter itself. But these early bird reward tiers, you say there are only like a hundred available and they're like really discounted. Um, if you're the first one to pledge, you're going to get a super good deal. And then it kind of like spills outwards where these other reward tiers are like a little bit better priced, you know, but still, you know, not the um, complete retail version that you're going to charge or whatever the price. And maybe some other ones are a really great deal. You're throwing in other stuff. Like I just um, managed a campaign for one called Lifesaver. And these guys, they created a multi-tool for campers and outdoor goers. It has like a water purification device. It has a fire starter. You can crank it and it will recharge your cell phone. Hmm. So we, they were also able to combine all of this into one device and you could like buy certain components of it. That one raised like 180,000 on Kickstarter. So, I mean, there are a lot of ways to go about it, but the idea is you want to make people feel special and you want to give them a great deal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's good. What else do you, what else do they do to like make a campaign successful? Cause I'd imagine there's more than just giving a great deal and having a, a good product. Uh, cause yeah. It, yeah. It seems like there'd be a lot of stuff on there that gets passed by if you're not doing it right. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole there's a whole formula behind it. I mean, hence the book, you know, the Kickstarter launch formula. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing that people need to be aware of is doing a pre-launch for the campaign. And what a pre-launch basically is, is it's getting people uh, excited, getting them to anticipate that something is coming. Traditionally, you do the pre-launch by doing something, by building an email list of people that are interested in seeing where they can buy the product. So let's just say you build up an email list of like 5,000 people. 
day one you go live, you have tons of people pouring into the campaign, you know, they support it, then it starts to trend really well on Kickstarter. That's just one simple example of what you could do to stand out from the crowd. Other people are launching campaigns without any email list. So they don't have any kind of like ignition behind it. Um, you know, other things you could do would be build up social media profiles. You could create a Facebook page, Instagram. You could do things like create a Facebook group and invite everyone um, into that group and sort of build a bit of a community before you go live. You can do a Facebook messenger bot. Like there's so much stuff you can do, but the, the pre-launch is so important because it really validates the product where people then who are strangers come to the campaign. They see there's a little bit of funding there already. And like, this is interesting. Like how did this thing get, you know, $80,000? How did this get 50 K? And they start to get interested and they watch the video and they're like, you know what? This is actually pretty cool. You know? And it's that thing in marketing we call social proof. So the, the name of the game is like, how do you cause that effect to happen to when you start to trend well on the actual platform and you start to get um, attention from PR and other outlets and those types of things. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense because people, a complete stranger coming to it and they go, Oh, I'm the first one. Somebody, somebody's gotta be the first one, but if they're not in your network, I think that'd be pretty tough for them to be the first one. So like you said, that social proof, and that was one thing when I was doing my uh, real estate crowdfund that, uh, you know, we, I, I had raised about a million dollars prior to somebody coming from the outside and investing the investor. Yeah. You have some, yeah, we already had built up and, and, you know, people, you're proving concept already. You know, right. Everybody yeah. says, Oh, that people believe in it. So then they're interested in it. And then obviously uh, like most kind of platforms, the more traction it gets, the more traction, the more like publicity it gets as well. Which people, don't wanna, people don't want to, people don't want to spend the attention to look into something unless it's cool, you know? Yeah. And even an investor, they don't want to sp- like take the time to analyze a whole offering unless they see other people are jumping in already. They're like, yeah. okay, there's something here. You know, I'm going to actually put the mental energy into figuring out what that is. You know, even if that's a good fit for me or not. Right. Right. I think it's a pretty natural thing to go. Why, why am I the first one? Like what, what am I missing that everybody else has already figured out? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with like with Bitcoin, right? Like when Bitcoin was just getting started and you start to see more people adopting it and you're like, wow, am I missing out on something? Like, yeah, is this yeah, going to yeah. be a thing? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. Cool. Uh, so let's talk uh, quick too about the real estate crowdfunding. Um, you know, things have changed since you wrote the book, but you got the, the book real estate crowdfunding explained. Yeah. Um, what, to talk a little bit about that book and, and sure, real sure. Estate crowdfunding opportunities. Yeah. So when I was writing crowd crux, um, one of the big things I was noticing was that this crowdfunding model, which kind of, you know, there's Kickstarter, Indiegogo, there's equity crowdfunding, there's nonprofit fundraising and crowdfunding, and there's real estate crowdfunding. And I started to know the, notice the model being applied to real estate. And I was like, that's really interesting. So I started to do some more research and kind of in the early days, you know, the way it was working with, you know, platforms like Realty Mogul originally with Fundrise and Realty Shares, um, these guys were like, putting up uh, one building and then everyone can own a small portion of that building, right? Mm -hmm. You're crowdfunding real estate, you're crowdfunding a building, which is pretty freaking cool. So you can have a bunch of investors investing a small amount of money versus just a few investors investing a lot of money, which is kind of how it's traditionally done. So you could have people just putting in, you know, like $10,000 or 5k versus having put in like $100,000 in order to become a part of a deal, which I thought was like pretty, pretty innovative. Um, and then kind of over the years, we noticed that a different model was starting to take on a lot more, and that's doing crowdfunded REITs or non-traded REITs. And that's kind of what we think of now when we think of like real estate crowdfunding. Um, those are the, definitely the bigger players. So people like Fundrise, Fundrise. using Regulation A+, um, in order to raise massive amounts of money. And they basically put all of this into a REIT, and then they go out there and they select the properties. So the investor just participates in the REIT. And they're not doing any of the management or anything like that. They don't have to know much about it. And then Fundrise goes out there and they are the ones actually selecting the properties. Right. So it's what's called a, a non-traded private read, a crowdfunded read. It's just not listed on a normal you know, stock exchange in that way. Yeah. And this is, this is massive. I mean, these guys have done like hundreds of millions of dollars um, you know, with real estate crowdfunding. And we have a lot more players coming in and even people um, who aren't even participating on the major platforms are still raising money. Like you raise money, right? And I was asking you, is it on CrowdStreet, is it on these ones? And you did it on a, a totally different one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's a small it's, private one. 
Yeah, yeah. And the cool thing is like, it's, it's really just taking something that exists already in the real world and putting it online, right? Yeah. So that all that behavior already exists. It's just kind of capitalizing on that, I think. Where do you see the future of all this going with the, with the crowdfunding, with the Kickstarters, uh, with charitable, all that kind of stuff? Where do you see it all kind of going in the future, evolving? Like, what's next? I think there, well, right now, I think equity crowdfunding is, is going to be the next breakout thing. Um, so this past year, 2019, about $100 million was raised with equity crowdfunding, mm-hmm. which is not you know, big compared to Regulation D or venture capital or angel investing, but it's still pretty sizable. Um, even to the point where I have people you know, just reaching out to me who have significant amounts to invest in their campaign or they're trying to run one. They raise like 200K and they're like, what can you do to do more, right? So we're, we're starting to develop more of a cottage industry around um, equity crowdfunding. You know, there, used to, there was also like the ICOs um, and STOs where people were doing digital token offerings. Um, and one of the companies in the industry was just acquired Crowdfund X, who was a marketing agency for those types of things. So I think we're seeing just the beginning, honestly, of all of these traditional activities being taken online and using kind of like novel 2.0 marketing ways to engage investors. So like how cool would it be if you have um, an investor who subscribed to a Facebook marketing bot, they get a personalized selfie video from you, the founder of the company, telling them about the company that you're doing and they can actually then invest in it. And they don't have to invest a thousand bucks, they can invest 200 bucks. Yeah. And how, how cool is that if you could invest in the next Facebook or the next Uber or these major companies and you can actually interact with the real person, the real founder behind it. Like we see all these champion heroes of entrepreneurs like Elon Musk, who were like, this guy, this guy is, is where it's at. And to be able to own a portion of their company is it kind of like, you're almost like part of a sports team. I had a guy on my show um, two days back who's doing an equity crowdfunding campaign um, for a sports team. And he's ra- you know, traditionally like rich people own a sports team. He's, cra- he's crowdfunding it. And individuals are actually to, able to own a portion of the soccer team. And, and they're in the United States, which is, you know, soccer isn't as big of a thing here. So it's like, a, it's a unique way to get people to participate and, um, and also, you know, earn, earn capital when the company is sold or they do distributions or something like that. So I just see it happening more and more and more. And I think it's, it's honestly like a window of opportunity for people who, you know, don't necessarily have a huge crowd they know like a little bit of social media and they've, they've really worked hard. They know their, their ins and outs with the prototype, but they're like, I want to get this out there on the world stage. How do I do that? How do I have a massive launch and get media attention? I think that's a really big opportunity for those types of people. Yeah. One thing I really, really like about crowdfunding and I hope it continues to uh, evolve and be like this is, is it really helps. It really helps the, like just everybody, right? It, it, where before even the playing field before like you had to know people you had to be able to get in front of the the right investors um you know now you can go to the crowd and the crowd can decide if your product is good or not so also you have to be you have to have a good product but you have to be very good at you have to do a good job at marketing it's it's Um, yeah it's literally the purest form of wealth creation Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then the other part, the other side of that coin, especially is when we look at like, you know, the equity crowdfunding, um, the, the real estate crowdfunding is that now people that never had access to this type of investment have access to it at the early stages. We never had that before. You never had pre, yeah. pre-public offering where non-accredited investors could even think about investing in stuff like that. And now they can I mean, if we were doing this podcast like 50 years ago or 100 years ago, you talk about the pillars of wealth creation and you'd be looking at access. How do you get to know the right people, get into the right circles? Now that doesn't matter as much. You know, the, the playing field is really leveled. If you have a good idea, you're willing to work hard, you can execute on it and bring it to the crowd. That's all you really need. You know, you have access to these people via the internet and you can create a, a great video and pitch the story and everything. So you really have everything at your disposal. It's the easiest time ever. Um, to start a business, to raise money, to do all of these things. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the easiest. Yep, maybe 
maybe the hardest. It's the easiest for everybody to get involved, which is why it's difficult. So you have to do things to stand out, right? You have to make sure you're going to that extra level to stand out. It's not just. Yeah. 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 I, I totally agree with that. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about my work is like, I see these creative people or inventors, engineers who are really intelligent, like really smart. And I'm like, I can never do what they do, you know, but they don't know how to present what they're doing to the world. And like, yeah. they, they have a great prototype or they have a great product or a great business idea, but they don't know how to bring that to people, convince people of that, get attention, get funding, like convert, convert people. And that always kind of frustrated me because I'm like, these people have such cool things that I want to use, but it's, they're not out there, you know? So that, that's why I speak, I think, with so much passion on, you know, my YouTube and all the stuff that I do. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, you're, you're being that voice and helping them get that, that idea out, that product out that everybody should be using, um, but they just don't have that side of the business. And a lot of people are Yeah, that. it's really inspiring too. Like I'll have people who come back on my show and they've done like 10 Kickstarters mm. and they've literally built a business and they're like, yeah, dude, like I got like five employees now, like things are going really well. And that's just, that's just so inspiring, you know, to see someone change and like literally the span of a year or two years. Um, like that's unheard of. And it's very rare that you see such high business success rates. Right. Yeah. But I think the fact that you like validate the product first, that's why a lot of these companies are in turn successful. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a really cool part of it. And then, you know, especially like the Kickstarter where they don't have to give away a big portion of their company to uh, these angel investors who are going to take a lot of it. Um, you know, that, that's the other beautiful thing, even with the crowdfunding, even with the equity crowdfunding, you're going to probably, uh, you're not going to be paying as, as big of sums of your company to the angel investors that are going to just want a ton, right? That's just how yeah. it is. If, if you're, you're trading like one boss for another. Yeah. Or for exactly. a few. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So a lot of cool stuff. What, I'm what curious. Else? So w with your, with your raise, like what did you take away from that? The fact, and you guys had a pretty successful raise. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I guess, you know, for one a big thing that I took away, you have to have your own crowd, right? You have to, you, it, at least for me, it, it worked really well already having my own investor group that already believed in what I do and, and my product, which is real estate. Um, and we're willing to put the money into it. So that proven concept was, was definitely huge. Um, you know, what else? I mean, it, it, you know, I think the presentation uh, was really big. The presentation, the marketing behind it is always, is always really big. And the communication, the open communication and dialogue um, was, was really important for being able to do the raise, uh, definitely. What did um, it feel like when you completed it finally? So it was crazy because we actually, um, we actually were closing on this property at the end of July and we didn't get our campaign out until after the 4th of July because there was issues. The, the people, people in, uh, in the city that had to, or not city, the state uh, that had to approve it were on vacation. So they didn't get it approved. So it was like yeah. weeks that went by. It was supposed to be approved. So it was like a shotgun deal. It was like, all right, we've got three weeks basically to get this thing completely funded. He had a hustle. Uh, yeah, it was a sprint. It was a sprint, and so yeah, when it happened, it was a massive relief. <laughs> when it finally, <laughs> when, when it happened, it was a big relief. It was, but it was fun. It was exciting to have it on there, and uh, I think it's still the largest. Uh, it was a score offering. Uh, it's just, so it's still the biggest offering in uh, in our state. So the, it's interesting. Yeah, within. Yeah, that that yeah. type of offering. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I think, I think that's amazing. And, um, I, I think it's such like a badge of a achievement as well. Being able to get that together so quickly, like that's hard. Yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely a stressful time, man. Uh, raising money. Well, and the 4th of July is tough, right? Cause everybody's out of time. Yeah. So you're trying to connect with your investors and they're like, Oh, I'm on vacation. And <laughs> you're like, I gotta raise this money by, you know, a couple of weeks. Like, we got to get on this, but everybody's yeah, on yeah. vacation. They're just, enjoying the the lakes and the cabins and all that kind of stuff so 
it was you know, stressful, but hey, it happened, and it was uh, definitely yeah, congrats, rewarding at the definitely. end. So yeah, cool. So what uh, what else do you want to tell our audience about um, you know about what you do uh, or mm -hmm. message you want to give to them um, regarding this uh, crowdfunding campaigning? You know, I think the biggest thing is that w when I was getting started, um, there wasn't really any good education. There wasn't a roadmap. You know, there weren't really weren't any like best practices or anything like that. It was kind of like the Wild West. Yeah. And I think we're fortunate now that we're at the point where we know a lot of what you got to do in order to get funded, whether that's, you know, real estate crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, or Kickstarter and more rewards based stuff, Indiegogo. And the, the resources are out there. You know, I'm just one of like many people out there that have podcasts and that try to educate on these things. So if you're at all interested, a great place to start is my podcast, Crowdfunding Demystified. You can go and also just browse around on Google and YouTube um, and learn a little bit about this. But really think about, you know, sometimes when we're talking about raising money, like as entrepreneurs, we're just, it's almost like turns into a job. Like you're so focused on raising money. Yeah. It consumes your life. You get away from what it is that you actually enjoy doing. Think a little bit about where you want to be, you know, in the next two to three years. And the cool thing about crowdfunding is it kind of like with you, it really makes you focus and compress all of this um, project you've been putting off and like really compress in the span of 90 days, right? And you got to get super serious. You got to get your ducks in a row. Um, you have to communicate well. It's kind of like a crash course in business, honestly. Yeah. So sure. I really like it for that reason. And um, I think that if you are at all interested, you know, just, just begin to search and the resources are out there. Um, my, my book, the Kickstarter launch formula, some of the other, you know, tenants, um, the biggest one that I think I can leave on is a lot of the times in business, we talk about like logic and investors. We talk about market size and market cap. But when it comes to crowdfunding, it's about relationships and understanding how to relate with someone else. Mm. And that's all focused on emotions. Yeah. So you're going to be doing a little bit of a different selling than if you're trying to create a pitch deck for a VC. Instead, you're going to be creating an emotional story around the product and allowing people to look at the thing and say like, I would want to, you know, carry that backpack when I'm going hiking. Like I could see myself as yeah. this actor or using this in this environment. And they start to almost sell themselves a little bit on it. So it's really about hitting those emotions. And, and that's where it, it differs a little bit than other things. Yeah, that actually, uh, that actually speaks to me because one of the things I tell people when they're trying to raise money for real estate is um, you want to sell the story, right? So you want to make yeah. sure the investors feel like they could live. Oh, I could see myself living there or I could see my kids living there. I could see myself living there when I was younger, whatever type of building it is, or I could see myself working there. Um, shopping there, whatever it is. And then when you're telling that story of how you're transforming the property, they can go, Oh, that's, that's really cool. the before and after. Yeah. Yeah. And they can see it, they can feel it. And even though they've maybe never been there, but they've seen, and they, now they see the drone footage, they see the, you know, the, the pictures and the videos and that type of stuff. And they go, Oh, wow, I've, I've been to this property and like they start said, to get excited. Yeah. Yeah. They get emotionally attached to it. And, uh, same thing with the backpack. Oh, I can see myself wearing that backpack, hiking the mountains, you know, whatever it is, I can do the same thing with the real estate. So I, that yeah. speaks to me. I, I think it's the biggest lie we've ever been told is that business is just all logic, you know, yeah, all numbers. It, it, it's really about, um, you sell with emotion and then you back it up with logic. Yeah. You know, and that, that's really how it works. Yeah, I, I couldn't couldn't agree more. And actually, I probably would have said you're wrong about five years ago because I thought oh, it's <laughs> all about the numbers. Like the numbers have to work perfectly, and they do. They still have they, to yeah, work. they do. Yeah, they still have to work. But emotion plays so big of a role in in all of us. We have to sell, and without the emotion, you're just not going to be able to do it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Definitely, really cool. Um, all right, well, I. I have a, a couple questions that I always ask all my guests. And so let's go through those. First of all, what's a favorite book other than your own uh, that you can pass on to our listeners, business uh, related, crowdfunding related, whatever you want. Oh man. Um, well, I, I recently ordered the new um, Russell Brunson book. I don't know if you follow him. He um, released a book called traffic secrets. I read his book expert secrets, which is really good. Like game changer. And, um, it's just, so if you, if you're like a coach or a consultant or, you know, you're doing educational kind of selling courses and stuff, 
Expert Secrets, really good book. I'm reading one right now called Wired for Story, which is about um, applying psychology and neuroscience to storytelling. So understanding why stories get people's attention and like get them hooked and stuff like that. So Wired for Story, um, that's another good one. Have you read uh, Building a Story Brand? No, but I've heard of it. Yeah, Excellent, I've heard of it. Excellent book. It's very similar to... Um, the, the Building a story about. brand. Okay, I'll great, great book that you gotta check out. Okay, cool. Got that so one. My, down. my final question uh, for you is: What are your three pillars of wealth creation? This is this is a good question, um, especially at this time, right? Mm -hmm. So I was traveling for I don't know, maybe like six months or so before this whole pandemic thing hit, and I was in the Philippines when it got locked down and then I went back to New York and then like there's a whole like almost lockdown there and stuff. And a lot of my friends have lost their jobs or they've been um, had their hours cut. And I think the great thing about being a business owner is like, as long as you're willing to work really hard, you're never going to be without a job and you don't make any stupid financial mistakes. You know, yeah. uh, if you know how to sell, you know how to market, you know how to work hard, like, that's always going to be available to you. So I think the first pillar of wealth creation is you got to create some kind of a business that brings money in. And then you kind of use that as a revenue source into some of your other activities, like, you know, investing in an index fund, buying real estate, you know, doing other like experimental stuff like Bitcoin. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways you can grow, grow money, but the biggest one is that you got to have some kind of income source that's independent from your job. Yep. Because your job can come and go, and, but the business you're never going to be fired unless you make a really stupid like you know financial mistake. Yeah, unless you fire yourself. So that'd be, I mean, that would be the first. Yeah, <laughs> unless you fire yourself, uh, that would be my first pillar. the The other one I would say is having a place to put your money. And I kind of started to in, experience this problem maybe like two years ago, where I was just kind of starting to save more and more, and I'm like, you know, I don't know what to do with this, right? right. Like, should I be investing in the stock market? Should I be trying to, you know, just invest for retirement with a Roth IRA? Well, that's going to be, you know, until I'm 65. So like, why would I do that? How do I invest in my business and like invest in the ads and stuff and grow my revenue? So I think the next pillar is knowing how to invest in that core business or knowing how to, where, where to put that money, um, which is, which is really important for growing it, you know? And then finally, I mean, I think, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to say, but wealth comes from people, yeah. right? Yeah. And having the right team around you, whether that's accountants, um, lawyers, having people to help out in your business, having people to help out in your investing or whatever, like that really is what determines your wealth over time, in my opinion. It's having smart people and um, assembling like that dream team. That's really where wealth is formed. You look at anyone who's really successful, like, they're not super intelligent. There are a lot of smarter people in the world, but they have access to a lot of smart people on their team. So knowing how to build that team, I think is a, is a massive pillar. Yeah, definitely. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Uh, very good. I, I like it creating cash flowing business and having a place to put your money and then building the right team. All excellent. Uh, great stuff, Salvador. Appreciate you joining us on the show. Um, you've mentioned a few places where the listeners can reach you what's the best place for our listeners to be able to reach you uh get to know a little bit more about you uh yeah so if you like podcasts type in my name salvador brigman b-r-i-g-g-m-a-n in itunes you'll come you'll find the crowdfunding demystified podcast that's a good place to start um if you like uh audio i also have the book the kickstarter launch formula on audible so you can just search that on audible and that will come up those are two easy places. Awesome. awesome. Definitely. Thank you, man, for, for having That's me on. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Definitely. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. Your rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really 
need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.